Lead, lead, lead. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called Now, and an activity called Work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, that's a good question. I thought being a stand-up comedian would be a lot of fun, or I thought I thought for a while about working for the UN. I thought mm. that would be a good job. Um, but I was pretty... You know, listless. I wasn't actually hugely career motivated um, until quite recently. I didn't have a, like a job I had in my brain as a child that I thought oh, I'd love to do that. So, and I've always enjoyed kind of leadership or teaching or the you know transmission of knowledge or information. So, I became a teacher. I am a teacher as well as the library stuff. So, um, I've always enjoyed that, and I thought I could do something with that. Um, I just didn't know what exact capacity. You're listening to Series 3, Episode 12, and to my guest, Jed Aitchinson. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 2nd of May, 2022. Hello, loves. Jed Aitchinson is the Project Manager at Binote LS6 Library of Things, which involves opening the library when they're open, running social media, growing and maintaining the stock of items, grant applications, arranging and doing publicity, and growing the membership of the library. He also teaches secondary science and tutors science and does some research with the university occasionally. To find out more about Binote Leads, go to binoteLS6.com. Like, share, follow, and subscribe to this podcast. I am doing all I can to bring this to you. So if you do like anything about it, please follow and promote the show on and off social wherever you can, whenever you remember to. Please give money to this show and please give me any feedback, questions, or comments that you may have. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com or use one of my social channels to get in touch. Links for all of those channels will be at the end of this episode. Now, please enjoy this totally free and totally ad-free, as far as I know, episode of Working Hours with Jed Aitchinson from Binault LS6 Library of Things. What is it that you're doing now? <laughs> uh, I, I do a number of things for both money and, uh, you know, pleasure and for work. Um, my, the, my day to day is I do, uh, supply teaching, um, and tutoring. So I'm a trained science teacher. Um, and I, I don't do that full time or I don't do that in a normal school environment. I do supply teaching and I do a lot of tutoring. So at the moment, actually tutoring a, an overseas student getting ready to come to a British university. So I do that in the sort of daytime, mm -hmm. uh, and that takes me from sort of eight or nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, the other 10 hours, 15 hours a week, uh, I work as the project manager for the library of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'll, I'll probably go into more detail about that later. And the other thing I do occasionally, and I'd like to do more is I was actually involved with some, uh, doing some research recently in kind of conjunction with the university and in particular, the Yorkshire circular lab, um, festival and project they had there. So that was really cool because what, what they tried, have you heard of the, the Yorkshire circular economy? Um, I'm familiar with the circular economy and, um, what's the name, Ellen MacArthur foundation. Um, but I'm not so familiar. I, like I did see that there was something going on in Leeds recently, just on social media, uh, to do with circular economy. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not familiar with the, oh, well, the York it's, uh, based one. There, it's pretty impressive. So there's this whole, it's, it's run from the university of Leeds and they try and kind of catalog and, and promote and advocate for and do research on the, the circular economy in the, in the whole of, of Yorkshire, so North, South, East, and West. Mm -hmm. And they got a, a big grant to do some, a big project recently called the Yorkshire Circular Economy Festival, where they tried getting, you know, dozens of circular economy initiatives in Yorkshire that exist to make stands at a digital festival mm -hmm. ground. And then people could digitally visit the stalls and read about it and go to their websites and do networking and go to events. And there was competitions, uh, for sort of grant money prizes and and part of that was um you had to find these circular economy initiatives and so there was about half a dozen researchers myself included who found in their geographic area about all the fantastic circular economy stuff that could be charity shops or recycling shops or you know there was a great one which was the you know cloth it might be a bit bizarre but there's um, a whole cloth nappy library and that's obviously advocating for a circular economy there's a 
baby sling library in West York in, in Leeds as well. So like when you borrow the sling to carry it. So it is obviously circular economy in terms of like Seagull's Paint or the Revive Centers or um, any one of the secondhand shops in Leeds or the Library of Things or Zero Waste Leeds or one of the bike mills and bike repair shops. So there was, my job was obviously Leeds. And so that's why I know so much about it. And it was fantastic. And that was about a month. I did that recently, six weeks approximately. Um, and that was a really fun job. Um, and I found about 120 and there's more that I are digging up in the weeds all the time. Um, and it's pretty amazing. And then there's, yeah, so that was something I did recently as, as proper work in exchange for monies. Um, and then do you want to know more about the, um, project manager of the library of things? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so it, it's kind of multifaceted. Um, so I do a lot of things for it. So. It's a, a library and, and you have to manage it. So you have to uh, do the, so we've got a, quite an active social media because the whole, obviously we basically exist upon people knowing about us and using us in exchange for money. Mm. And so it, it, we need to tell people that we have things, that they can borrow them and that we exist. Simply the act of existing, mm. we need to tell people that we exist because we're very new, seven months old and the library itself is, is an alien concept to a lot of people. They don't, mm -hmm. we, we haven't grown up with a library of things around the corner. And so we have to, I have to actively push it into people's heads, Yeah, which is fine, but it's, it's just work. Um, then you have to, so once you'll know about it, but then you have to tell them what is in the library and you have to, and we're getting donations every, we're growing every week because we get great donations that people want to give us to make the library better. So we tell people about the new stuff we have or the stuff we have used in a certain capacity. So. We almost make dioramas or kind of, you know, um, illustration cases where we'd say, are you trying to do this? Well, borrow these things. Or are you trying to have a party? Look at what you can do with our stuff. Are you trying to go camping? Look what you can do with our stuff. Are you trying to do some DIY? Look what you can do with that. The point I'm trying to get at is you have to put it into people's brains. Oh yeah, I, that's something I want to do. Here's how I do it. Um, but that's a big proponent, big proportion of it because you know, we've got 800 things and I want them all to be borrowed and I yeah. want them to be used as effectively as possible. Yeah. Um, that's one aspect, which I, I quite enjoy. I, I like the idea of, you know, sharing it and, and, and doing stuff like that. Then there's, you know, publicity like I'm doing with you. So, you know, again, we need to tell people about us. And so, you know, we get onto, you know, local news, the, the BBC, local magazines, other Facebook pages, other kind of green organizations, mm -hmm. just sharing and spreading the word and stuff like that, getting, um, I do a bit of work on the acquisition of grants. So we got a lovely grant recently at the library too, which was very easy. We got a great grant, uh, to buy some new stuff. So I had to apply for the grant, you know, get it, buy the stuff with the grant and then feedback to the mm -hmm. grant funder to say yeah. what we use it for, how effective it was and stuff like that. So we got a great pizza oven, you know, gazebos, um, dehydrators, karaoke machines, um, some other stuff that I can't think of that on my head. Some, uh, yeah, so we've got some fun stuff from that and people have used it, which is, you know, the whole point of what we have is that people can use it, but it's work to, to get to that point. You have to think, Ooh, this is grant exists. How can I use it for our, our means? How can I buy the best stuff that we need for it? And then evidence it and have a, you know, a, a relatively in-depth analysis of, of what you've done. That's mm -hmm. work, but that's an enjoyable component of it. Um, we, I obviously run the day to day of the library. So when it's open, I'm usually there just sort of dealing with borrowers and volunteers and the items and showing people around and, you know, checking things out, checking things in, advocating for more stuff. So, you know, if someone's come in for a party and they want to borrow one thing, you know, I advocate for and say, Hey, have you thought about this as well or this and to, to make your party better? Mm. Um, so that's an enjoyable, um, part of the project. Um, we obviously do. Pat testing of the item. So everything that is electrical is, is safe. And so we pat test, which is portable appliance testing, and we make sure it's electronically safe. Mm -hmm. We acquire new items and we have to catalog them. So description, pricing, putting on the website, stuff like that, dealing with reservations. So you like approve or don't approve reservations, mm -hmm. approve or disapprove new members, just dealing with the bump of, of running a, a thing that exists, feeding the beast, as I like to say, you know. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the supply teaching and that kind of work, is that regular and steady? Is it something that 
allows you to do the the library of things or like and and how did they come about did the one enable you and support you into doing the other yeah. or did they both yeah. kind of come well, about at the same time yeah. i kind of so if we, well we'll get to covid but i kind of made an active decision to pull back from mainstream normal teaching to mm. allow myself the mental and physical time and energy to pursue a passion project for lack of a better word yeah and i as well as that it gets even better because i actually moved to leeds partly because i knew it would facilitate a lower cost of living because mm -hmm. i'm from the south mm -hmm. and so i knew that it's cheaper up here not denigrating the north but it's mm -hmm. inherently a cheaper place by virtue of the economic circumstances and i knew that if i move here you know, and do teaching, it'll be cheaper. And then I realized maybe teaching not for me. So then I, I so stepped back even still, I made another decision to work less intensive teaching to facilitate me being able to do the library of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and because my overheads are relatively low by living in the North, by living a quite humble lifestyle, which I enjoy, but it's, you know, uh, a decision I've made mm -hmm. is I can then have the time and the energy to pursue a project like the library of things. Mm -hmm. I could not, I categorically could not have done this. A, probably in a more expensive place and mm -hmm. B, with a full-time teaching jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a question of energy there, isn't it? Really of like having the energy after doing a full-time job to be able to do something else like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I and if, if you want to, we can, if, if you don't mind, maybe I'll, I'll talk about COVID. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can go straight into it because I've got a question on it anyway. So yeah, well, go, it, go ahead. It's, it's just that it, it, it it's really cool because it impinges on why my life changed. Mm. So I was teaching full time at a school and I wasn't very good or I wasn't enjoying it or something wasn't clicking mm. and it was kind of, you know, not super great time. And then COVID happened and I went from working like 55, 60 hours a week to like 25. Mm. Um, and so, you know, my, I had. So without COVID happening, I probably would have finished my year and then just got another job and just sort of probably, you know, done a relatively mediocre job at my job in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. But because I had this like outside forced break or this like, you know, thing that happened to everyone, mm -hmm. it allowed me the kind of mental brain space to think, what do I really want to do? Um, and, and actively be able to pursue it. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty amazing. So I went from working at, like I said, 50, 60, 25, so I could really you know, regain some, you know, perspective or regain some, or just, you know, have experiences, which meant I could think, oh, maybe a library of things might be a good idea. Mm. And so, you know, it, uh, you know, but I, I think what's interesting is I suspect a lot of other people have done the same thing. Yeah. We probably haven't seen it yet, or it's, you know, how, how many people have not sorry, I'm, I'm thinking in tangent, how many people haven't gone back to their job that they had before because they realized it wasn't super great because they had this forced change how many people yeah. change careers or did something new or simply aren't going back to the old situation they mm. went to before because they've had some time to have some perspective and you know i'm one of those people and i'm making this what i think quite good project mm. how many other fantastic projects have come from people having the, the brain space and the thinking space to pursue their passion project because you know furlough was practically ubi yeah that's not a denigration of it but it was um it allowed people you know to keep the, the doors at the, the, the walls of the door at, at bay mm. and they could do something else. A lot, some people squandered their uh, lockdown time. Some people didn't, um, mm. I'd like to think I didn't. Mm. So, um, but it would, I, I cannot say uh, the COVID, the 19, the, the, the library of things would not happen in Leeds had it not been for COVID-19 mm. and that's a fact. I mean, was it something that was kind of in your head already before that or yeah. Yeah. I, I loved it. I, yeah. you know, you know, we talked about like, what do I want to do as a kid? I didn't know. I think I didn't know anyway. And then I was in 2017, I was probably 23. Mm. Yeah, so about 23, so five years ago nearly. And my mother sent me an article about it because she knows I like sustainability and stuff like that, which I do. And she, and it was like this light bulb lit in my head. It was like the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard of in my life. Uh, and it was like, a, a, there was like a before and after. And I'd always thought it was wonderful. And I'd, I actually had tried starting one in my hometown which is my, very, my, very small. I tried to do, doing peer to peer yeah. lending, which isn't bad, but there's actually apps for that. And maybe we could talk about it if you wanted, but I tried it to get my head around it. And I thought about it and I kind of put it to bed with a kind of, cause I was doing teacher training, which is a relatively intense year and then stuff like that. So, and I had some other stuff going on. So I kind of, 
and working where I lived just would not have, it would not have had a lot of things. Yeah. Or it could have, but I wasn't mature enough or smart enough at that point. I was just, you know, a young man. Um, and it was at the back of my head, pursued career teaching, COVID happened, it sort of rekindled in my brain. And Leeds didn't have one, which is the key thing. You know, Leeds mm. is a really big city. Mm. And it was actually, it wasn't behind, but it was, it was almost odd that it didn't have one yet. Yeah. Because a lot of other big cities do have them. So mm. Glasgow has one, Edinburgh has one, London has about eight now. There's one in Brighton, in Lewis, in Bristol. There's one in Birmingham. There's soon to be one in Manchester. There's one in Exeter now. There's one in York now. Mm. There's one in Froome. There's one in Oxford. There's, they're trying to get one up in Cambridge. Mm. There's one in Plymouth. There's one in Curno. There's a few more. Oh, and there's, I think there's, yeah, that's it for now. But there's about two dozen in the country. Mm. But there isn't one, say, in Liverpool. There isn't one, say, mm. in Bradford or in Sheffield or, mm. you know, Nottingham or Reading or these big, or Portsmouth or Southampton, you know, in my opinion, most libraries should have one or, or two. Um, and so it's, and I know that the other cool thing is I moved here and I, one of the first things I did was I Googled like Leeds Library of Things. Mm. And what was interesting is they actually tried doing one in 2016, which would have been, mm. if they'd got it up then, that would have been ahead of the curve by far. That would have been really at the forefront of it in the UK. Cause the first one only opened in 2014, mm. if they'd done it in 2016, it would have been remarkable. Mm. Um, and they're doing, they've done a crowdfunder and they hadn't raised much money. Mm. Um, and that's partly because the zeitgeist wasn't there. Mm. They were doing some other things. I met, there was the people at Hyde Park Source, if you know them, they're like a, um, a gardening CIC and they do some mm. volunteering work and some X, Y, Z work. So they, um, they're good people, but they just, it wasn't their priority. So they didn't push it. I loved it. I think it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and it's the best thing that there's no downside. It's like, mm. how can it not work? How, how can, it's just, it's mind numbingly simple how, how well it works and how good an idea everyone, ever, no one has ever criticized it mm. because there's nothing to criticize mm. because what, what's there to not like about the option to borrow something instead of buying it for a fraction yeah. of the price, fraction of the carbon, fraction yeah. of the space in your home. But what's hard about it is, you know, telling people this brand new thing, mm. getting over some of the hurdles of financial viability for lack mm. of a better word. And, um, you know, to growth in it with a capital G, it's just about, you know, it, it, growing a business is a new thing. Like we are a startup, for lack of a better word. We are a, a new young business. Um, mm. And so, but what's great is that, you know, it's, what's interesting. So am I, should I be doing anything else? Am I doing? No, no, no. I'd, I'd like, if I, if I, I'll, I'll bring us back or change the subject to whatever. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but what's cool about the library now is, and this is what's so amazing about it is six months when we first opened or before we opened, we are really pushing the sustainability. Okay. I was like really advocating, look how much carbon we're going to save. So I tried to go, because six months ago, obviously that was more of a zeitgeist because people were doing the. Extinction Rebellion, there's a lot more um, protests, you know, um, and that's all well and good, but obviously the zeitgeist has changed mm. in, in society because of the, the cost of living crisis, the perceived cost of living crisis or whatever. And so mm. instead of just not advertising at all, we can shift the dynamic of advertising or the dynamic of advocacy from sustainability to now cost of living. Mm. And this is my point. It's like a twin, twin, twin attack or twin two pronged attack. Mm. You, you can go, you can talk to the XR people and the green pieces and the zero waste living leads people about the sustainability, but you can also then talk to the, I don't know, citizens, citizens advice bureau, the, you know, the charities, the government, the councillors about the cost of living savings as well. Mm. You can basically tell anyone to use it legitimately, and it could help them either save carbon, save money. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I brought that up, but that's how we're currently, that's how I'm currently advocating for the library by saying how big of the a cost of living saving it is. Mm. I mean, uh, I can't remember what you said exactly earlier, but it, it made me think, you know, it's, um, it was around people guessing the concept and it's, it's a mindset change from, it is. you know, the consumer mindset of if you're going to use anything, you need to purchase it and own it, even though you know, most of the items that you purchase, you're going to use, like most of the time, they're going to stay dormant. They're not going to be, be used. They're not going to be utilized. They're just hanging around, taking up space until they eventually go to landfill. So it's like, you know, 
why why spend the fortune on disco lights when you could go and borrow them for the, mm. the couple of hours that you need them? Yeah, it's yeah. We we we've grown up in a kind of not it's not denigration, but we've grown up in a, in a, in a consumer capitalist system, mm. and so we've been told that if you need something, you buy it. Mm. Okay, that that's how we've been told to solve the problems that we have. I have a situation. The solution is buy it to fix it, mm. or you can't afford it. So you don't buy it. So you don't fix it. But there's a whole segment of things that people don't realize that they can borrow because they've not been told that they can borrow, but there's not been the mechanism till now to borrow it instead of buy it. Yeah. And, um, I think what's hard is that people, whether, whether, whether people will admit it or not, whether they like it or not, I think people do like to own things. Mm. People do like the act of owning something sometimes. Mm. I know that some people could borrow from us, but they probably want to own it. Even though they know they're not going to use it super often, they want to own it instead. Mm. I think that's, and that's not a denigration. It's just that their, their mindset is, um, is not, is not there. Mm. It's just an act of changing or just simply an act of, unfortunately, financial necessity. I mm. su I suspect that more people are going to use us, not because they necessarily want to, mm. they probably want to own it, but they simply can't afford to own it, mm -hmm. which is a shame, I guess, that it, it is forced upon them rather than desired upon them. Well, but, uh, and supply as well. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's the whole access over ownership kind of thinking, um, you know, you don't need to own everything because you're not going to use it that much most of the time. No. Um, no. but then, you know, you've also got with sort of energy descent and like with COVID and supply line problems, and then, you know, you've got things like what's happening in India at the moment and. Like things happening everywhere that are all going to affect prices and all the prices are going up and supply is going to change and all of these things are going to change. So like we might not be getting as much stuff. Some people might need to share it more. So yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah. um, but that's, what's interesting is I, I couldn't have predicted the cost of the loan crisis, but and whether we like it or not, I've been part of the, well, we are part of the solution to it. Mm. And it's, it's quite exciting to be at the forefront of this. And I've not seen many other libraries really. I don't know how they do it, but I've not seen many other libraries really push the cost of doing stuff the same way I have, mm. um, or we have, because, you know, when we got on the, we went on the BBC and they'd kind of fobbed us off for a bit and that's not identic. They just have lots of things to cover and we're not always the priority. But what was interesting is when cost of living became more pressing in the, in the, in the public eye, mm. that's when they decided to talk about us because we were one of the solutions. So, you know, we're the success of us. And the willingness of people to, to help us has come from the very fact that more people need us. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah. BBC wouldn't have covered us if people didn't need it. And the BBC covered us so that people used it because they need it. So it's like, it's a kind of a weird kind of tautology. It's like a circular thing, mm. uh, which yeah. is great. Um, and so, you know, can we maybe, maybe we could talk about some of the things we're, we're doing at the library right now. Yeah, sure. Is, well, so we, we. We're coming into summer, which is really exciting because again, part of my, my job or task is, is advocating for what we've got and it's seasonal. So, you know, every season things change. And so mm -hmm. you're telling people at different points, how they can, how their lives can be improved by borrowing instead of buying, or how this thing could make the thing they want to do even easier or more exciting. So, you know, in spring, we did a whole advocacy of spring cleaning. So pressure washers or the gardening stuff we've got. We're coming more into summer season. So we're doing more stuff on street parties with the Jubilee. We're doing more advocacy of camping and tents. Mm. Then in autumn, we'll do another round of stuff to do with, you know, clearing up the garden for winter. So, um, you know, cutting things back, things of that nature. In winter, we'll do some more stuff on, you know, Christmas parties. And then mm. the cycle continues. And all while that's going on, you know, we'll get new items, I hope. Like some of the things I really would like to get, which I know would be really fun is like, a, because another, sorry, another thing that I, I do is it's about predicting demand as well. You need to get mm -hmm. ahead of, ahead of consumer demand, because if you can get it before people want it, then they'll come to you instead of buying it. Does that make any sense? So yeah, yeah. if you can let them borrow it, as soon as they've realized that they want to buy it, then they'll come to you. But if you tell them a month or two later, then they've already bought it and you kind of not push them to you. So it's about finding things that you know that people are going to want mm -hmm. almost before they even want it or predicting borrow demand. Mm -hmm. So the classic example that we've got is we got a really nice um, pizza oven, an uni, uni pizza oven. Mm -hmm. And that was 
great because a lot of people want to try making their own pizza because it's quite fun to, you know, pizza stuff, mm -hmm. but they're 330 pounds. They're really expensive. And you know, you don't do it all the time and mm. you also want to try it before you buy it. So we had a guy, we had two people, we had four people borrow, four or five people borrow it now. We've had one person borrow it and then he's going to buy one. Mm -hmm. Great. And we've had one person borrow it and then isn't going to buy one. So mm -hmm. everyone's happy because he's found out he does want it. She's found out she doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. And everyone's, it, it's just a useful tool to be able to borrow something before you want to buy it. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of people are just going to borrow it without the intention of ever buying one. Yeah, um, they just want to, they want to have fun with it and then bring it back because they're, they're quite big, they're quite heavy, they're quite bulky. So it makes sense to, to not buy one. Mm. Some things you're also looking at getting is like, I really want to get for the library, a, one of those window cleaner attachments mm. that you clean your own window with. Because how many people want to clean their windows, don't have the tool and don't have the money to pay a window cleaner. Mm. And like, another thing we try and do is almost, I think the library is like a, a, a foundation upon which society can sit. And that's a bit bold, but. What I mean by that is, is it should be a resource that people can tap into to make their project work. So yeah. the community event could be done using our stuff yeah. or the pizza party could be, or the um, film night at the community center or the, you know, uh, girl guide or scout troop or the, you know, family center or whatever, or say a new community group wants to start, then they borrow stuff from us or a new protest or demonstration wants to be done. So they borrow stuff from us to make the badges or make the stickers or with the loud hailer, or maybe someone wants, is a new homeowner, wants to do up the house, but obviously isn't planning on doing it every year. So they mm. borrow our stuff. So we should be able to have people and organizations sit on us and rely upon us for success or wouldn't be able to start without us existing. Mm -hmm. Is what I, I, is what I want it to become like a bedrock upon which, or a resource to tap into, mm. to, to then do stuff. With. I mean, for example, you know what, in the long term, we could possibly think about lending stuff to people for business purposes. Mm -hmm. So like, say they want to borrow a window cleaner for a week, do a whole bunch of window cleaning for money and then bring it back. And they use the borrowing and they eventually raise the money to buy their own. So are yep. we the thing that's led, led a startup, startup, uh, maybe hopefully mm. or have we been, uh, what's the other one I was going to say? Oh yeah. And then like, so say you want to be a, like get into graphic designer, get into, you know, sticker manufacturer or like making something. We really want to get a, a cry cut machine and we have a 3d printer, which we're happy to lend people. So how many people want to try 3d printing, but can't afford the startup costs and maybe want to do it to then print something to then sell or print something for a thing to then make some money. So could we be the thing that they borrow from to then get the thing to print, to then make the money to then buy their own and mm. a startup has begun. Mm. So what, what we do, and it's a term of economics, we lower the barriers to entry into all these fantastic activities. Mm. So it's all about lowering. It's about making things easy. If you make these easier, cheaper, more things get done, mm -hmm. which things more, which is good. You want more things to be done. You want people to be able to actively pursue their goals easily mm. and, and effectively. Cool. Uh, so let's talk about hard economic reality for it then. So, um, have you, are you a charity? Is it a CIC? Like, um, have you incorporated it? What are your overheads like? And in terms of income, are you relying on like monthly subscriptions? In which case are people paying, you know, or are some people paying more than they should be to kind of subsidize other things? Like how, how are you working it? Um, Fantastic question. So, um, we are a CIC, so a community interest corporation. We are incorporated. So we have a, you know, a, we are a business or, a, you know, legally registered with the company's house. We mm -hmm. have a business bank account. We have, um, you know, all these mechanisms in place we have. So we make, I'll, I'll break down the, the figures coarsely. We make about 25% of our monthly money from donations from people monthly, so not for a specific item. We then make about 75% of our money from people just simply paying for stuff and making donations when they borrow. Mm -hmm. And in terms of covering costs, we are just about now covering our costs. And that's after six months. Yeah. Um, and so we do ask people to make donations when they borrow. Yeah. And some people do, you know, some, you know, and th this is what's nice about Page You Feel is is some people do pay over, okay? Some people pay more than they should because they believe in it and want other people to be able to afford to not pay as much because they can't mm. afford to. 
Yeah. So, so it does, it barely works. And we're like, you know, we're, we're running on thin ice. So, you know, we just need it to grow and, you know, but this is the problem is that if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work, unfortunately. So we'd have to change the model to a bit more of a yeah. specifically financially driven model, mm. which I don't think none of us really want. I don't want to do it particularly. I mean, I, I am introducing some ideas of recommended donations, which really helps, mm -hmm. but it's mainly volume. Like the problem isn't money per person because people do give us money and that most people give us enough money. Mm. What the problem is, is we've got 800 things and not yeah. all 800 of them are going out. Yeah. You know, I'd much prefer a system where we double our loans weekly rather than rather than having to double our price. Yeah. Cause that, cause we have the things it's, it's, we've already acquired them. It, it makes no difference to anyone. If we just simply lend more things, it mm. does make a, a problem if we have to raise prices to make it financially viable. Mm. So we just need more people to use us. And that, that's not a denigration of people. It's just, you know, there's 800,000 people in the city and not 800,000 people know about us. Mm. And that's why I'm pushing so hard on the publicity. And more importantly, you know, we could get a grant to acquire new stuff that people do want to borrow. Yeah. Okay. So it's about growth in terms of stuff and people. It's about yeah. getting enough stuff and enough people. Yeah. They matched up and you get the volume of, of trade that yeah. makes you financially viable. Yeah. And you know, that's where grants come in or investment comes in or stuff like that. So, you know, we're probably going to buy some new stuff in the next few months, um, which is really good. We're going to put in grants to get stuff and, you know, subsidize some of the, the, the models that we use, you know, it's exciting. I mean, in yeah. six months, we've gone from zero members to 1,200 wow. and we're doing about 120 loans a month. Yeah. Um, about 30 a weekend, roughly. Mm. Um, and as summer comes in, you know, we're in early April. Are we in May, yeah, no. May. Um, and you know, it's not even summer season yet. It's not even camping yeah. season. It's not even, you know, big gardening season. Yeah. So, you know, I'm excited about growth in members, but also just, you know, you know, August, July, September should be our busiest months mm -hmm. and we've not experienced that yet. And I'm really looking forward to experiencing and, and seeing the volume that we get then, because unfortunately what goes up must come down because we're, we're inevitably going to do less borrows in the winter months mm -hmm. because of you're not doing as much. Mm -hmm. And that's the same for most businesses. Now we'll probably get a jump in Christmassy karaoke stuff or Christmassy party stuff or, you know, Christmas events. We'll have a lot of gardening stuff in November and October with, you know, people pulling in their gardens, but January was rough. I mean, we were really struggling in January because well, A, was a terrible piece of COVID. A, B, we had, you know, a third of the members. But C, people just don't use the kind of stuff we have in, in those months. So what we also need to do is get things that are year-round borrows. I, mm. You know, it's, it's not, it's all very well having a great August. But if, you have, if you have a crap December, then yeah. it's not good. So you need to get things that, that can and should be used all year round um, to, to make that, so that you make money all year round. Yeah. So... And I can't tell you right now what I've got some ideas, what they are, but I don't know exactly what are the, the, you know, forever season items. So, uh, I mean, do you survey your members, uh, anything like that? Have you, have you done that yet? Have I what, sorry? Survey the members. Um, no, cause I'm lazy. Um, okay. <laughs> well, you're do... obviously not that lazy. <laughs> you're yeah, trying... <laughs> yeah. Well, what I do is <clears throat> I do it far more ad hoc. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause I surveys, we, I just don't have the time and I don't think, and we've done, we've done it once we mm -hmm. did it in November. Cause we, um, and no one really responded to it. Now it was just like yeah. a Facebook and a social media post, yeah, yeah, yeah. no one really gave us some ideas. What, what I do do is whenever people ask us for stuff, I always make a mental note of it. Mm. So that's a really good way of getting what people want. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, cause I, we have a social media and we follow most of the other libraries. Mm. And we, I like to see what they get requested for and what they ask people for. And if they want it in that city, then they probably want it, want it here too, if that makes sense. Yeah. How so, far away do you think like the, a, an official kind of linking up of various libraries of things? I mean, they've tried, but they all, no one's got the money. No one's got the resources yeah. to do it. There's yeah. one in London. There's, there's almost two competing network, not ideologies. A couple of people have all come to the same conclusion that 
yeah, we need to make a network, but mm. no one has the time or mm. no one has the resources. Mm. So Edinburgh, I know, run two libraries or I've at least set the one in Glasgow. London has a whole... Do you want to talk about the London Library? It's a bit... Yeah, sure. But it, it might be worth talking about in terms of networks. Yeah. But what they do is it's... I'm not going to say it's worse, but it is... It's not as ambitious. Right. What they do is they basically have a big set of cupboards with electronic locks on in a pre-existing community space. Right. Like a library, community center, whatever. Yeah. Um, and they, there's about 10 items, 10 or 20 items. And they're the most common ones. They're like pressure washers, carpet cleaners, drills, mm. stuff like that. You know, the real meat and bones of a library, but also small enough to be man portable. They have those and you make an account, you pay for it, and then you get like a access to open the gate and then you put it back in. Mm -hmm. There's no man person running it and it's not staffed. It's just looked after by the community place that already exists. Mm -hmm. And they've got loads of those. They've got about eight of those in the city, but they're very small and they're not very ambitious. Um, and they're also very expensive. They're about, a so we, most libraries charge between 10 and 20%. They charge something like a third for three days. Right. It's really expensive because they've got quite, which doesn't make any sense because anyway, because they've got maybe a high overhead, they can afford to charge a premium because it's London and people have more money or, mm -hmm. or the, 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 the premium on space in a home means that you're willing to spend more to simply not have to even take up the space. And so they're, they're doing okay. They're growing all the time, but they've got very low. So each one is like almost self-sustaining or each one is, doesn't need a lot of love. Whereas most other libraries, they're the aberration. Most of the libraries have like a big room full of stuff, but they often have like a workshop attached to it, or they run a repair cafe from it sometimes, or they do clothes exchanges or like toy exchanges, or they have, might have a small refill section as well, or a small cafe section, just because unfortunately library does now, if, if you get a library big enough, you can make it run its own, but actually what's good is having other income streams for yeah. a better word. Yeah. So. A lot of, you know, we're quite small and very young. Um, we don't do that. Um, but I've got some plans to maybe do that. So that's how most of them run. Now, Edinburgh, like I said, has Glasgow and Edinburgh. And there's one, and then some people try to start networks from a, one in Frome called Share Frome. They've tried to make a, a kind of a network, but it just, it, it just never follows through because it's just not the resources for it. And it's, it requires so much on the ground thinking. You really need to be where you are to do it. Mm. because you, you, there's a lot of nuances and you need to get lucky with space as well. Mm. So, yeah, I was going to say with like inventory and distribution, you know, cause you've got your basic overheads, you've got getting income in to pay for it. And then you've got all your inventory, where to put it, how much that costs, whether yes. people can get in that space to look around or whether it's just stuff to a uh, space to store things. Mm. And then the, the catchment area of like who can visit and how far you can send stuff. Yes. Well, I'd like to think about eventually being able to do delivery because some mm. people want to borrow stuff, but don't have a car. Yeah. Um, or just have a bike instead or whatever, or just also don't have the convenience to come in specifically when we're open. Mm. So that makes sense. So I'd love to, be, I'd love to be able to do delivery, like get one of those zero, one of those electric vans and drive around doing deliveries on like certain hours and certain days. That's what I think would be really useful. Because like big stuff like a ladder or a whole bunch of camping stuff. Mm. And the point is, or a whole bunch of event stuff, you want to take it to a place, mm. then use it. And then, then so that's something I think would be handy. And some of the libraries do that. They do it on um, like electric bikes. And they also rent trailers for you to take your stuff back with. So you rent the thing and the trailer on your bike and then take it back now. Yeah. Which is quite clever. So in terms of overhead, so we've talked about how libraries make money, I think just now, or, you know, but in terms of, overheads for us right now, they're pretty low. So we have domain name rental for our website, um, at monthly, we have a business pigeon pigeonhole for, for mail. We have the rent for the library room itself, mm -hmm. which includes like Wi-Fi and utilities and stuff like that, which is really nice as most commercial rent does. Mm -hmm. We have volunteer expenses. So like food and petrol money and parking if people need it. Mm -hmm. And we've also got spares and repairs. So things break or things need to be, that's nature of the beast. So we mm. have a budget or need to spend money on maintaining our items. Mm. Uh, we have annualized costs of our insurance. We have annualized costs of domain name ownership. 
Mm -hmm. and like email stuff. So we have to pay money for that. And then we get audited. So we need to make sure our accounts are in order and we might end up having to get, say like, um, some editing, some, we've got accounting right now, mm -hmm. we're going to get some accounting software, which is relatively affordable, but that is another monthly cost. And so those are the basic overhead costs that we have. I mean, we have a few of the nibbly bits here and there, like sometimes to get them, we get in water. I went, I sent it to, um, Leeds independent life, which is a magazine. So we've now got a. We're now on, on the um, map of independent retailers so that cost a bit of money. You know, we have to buy, you know, first aid kits or buy, um, just stuff to make the library work or new pens or mm. new stationery, or mm. we have to, you know, pay a deposit to get to a, um, a store at a, f at a festival to, to advocate for our library. So, mm. so that's it really that, that I and mean, obviously salaries is, is something we don't take into account right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, if, you can't yet, can you really? No. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're getting by. We're getting there. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's a really positive sign that within six months, you you know, you're getting towards break even. That's that's one of the hardest bits to get to. Yeah, yeah. And we are, we are. I mean, yeah. in February, I was pretty worried about it failing because we were just making so little money. Yeah. Um. And but I just basically worked hard at getting items and getting members and getting them to give us money. So. Mm. <laughs> Uh, you know, it relies upon people using it. it there's no point having 800 things and then not going out. There's no point in it. You just, need, you just need everyone to know that this resource exists so people borrow from you instead. Mm. It's, a, it's a question of volumes, in my opinion. Yeah. It, it's a question of acquiring stuff. Yeah, we have to get a grant or invest in it that mm. people want. And then getting the people to know about the things that they want to use. And it's, mm. it, it's a question of numbers. It's just volume, isn't it? But any business will tell you that. Yeah. But it's, you know, what's cool to me is and this is kind of going to sound a bit mathy is, you know, we've got about a thousand members or 1,200 members now and about 800 items mm. and we're doing about 120 loans a month. Okay, mm. great. That's, that's pretty good. What happens though, and this will happen when we get like 2000 members and like 1500 items, mm. because at that point you've doubled. So if, if there's a relationship between them, then if you've doubled one and you've doubled the other, then actually it would go up four times in mm. theory, because you've got twice as many people with twice as much stuff. So statistically, you might actually get four times busier. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's, what's cool to me is it, it's almost exponential growth. It's certainly not linear or it's, mm. and I, yeah, it's exponential. It's, yeah. So it's cool. Cause when we had like 400 items and 400 things, we were doing like 10 loans a month or 20 loans a month. Mm. We double both. We've got to 120. Mm. So when we get 2000 and 2000 or 2,500, then you know, to me, then you get like 400 loans a month yeah, and then you're really, really kind of firing on all cylinders. Um, and that'd be amazing. Um, and then you've like, you know, but th what's great to me is like, the more people you help, the more people you make, the more money you make. So the more people you can help. Yeah. It's a circle of, of, of goodness. So positive feedback, the money to invest in more stuff yeah, to then help more people to then, so it's, it's growth is good because yeah. What's not like, what's not so like about us helping more people, which simultaneously means that we can keep helping people. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, 800,000 people in Leeds, I'm not saying that all of them are going to use us or that all of them are close enough to use us, but you know, there's 50,000 people in Headingley alone, mm. you know, so it's just about volume. It's just about getting people to know what you do and so, investing in it. So who are the people that are coming in then? Is it, is it students? Is it, you know, is it? greeny people yeah. is it anyone is it people who like can't afford to be getting stuff like what is it a real mix what what are you getting in terms of clients customers it's a real mix because, borrowers uh yeah i never had to call the one yeah we call them borrowers really yeah <laughs> um so we have it is a mix okay it's definitely a mix now what's surprising to me is actually a surprisingly low number of students mm. because i think the problem is they are not cliquey but they just don't exist in the community like a normal member yeah. of society. Yeah, they're yeah, very yeah. Uh, incestuous in the they're like university society and the university things. Yeah. And they don't really know about the normal everyday happenings of Headingley yeah. with the, in the community. Yeah. That's not a problem. It's just, it's hard to access that pool. Yeah. Now we've, we've kind of put some pokers in. So we've put like, we've gone in the, in the Griffin, which is the, the Leeds university newsletter. Yeah, yeah. Been on, we've been, um, interviewed recently by a student journalist. We're going to do some work in the next few months, getting some publicity material for specifically to, to tell university students about us, you know? So, but it's, yeah, I mean, we get a few, but not many. We actually get a lot of, um, parents and like 
people who kind of own the problem is, is you need someone who owns stuff and has the capacity to, to do stuff to it, but doesn't have the stuff to do it with. So we wouldn't get a renter coming in because they can't do any DIY stuff. We get a renter coming in for party stuff, but we couldn't get a renter coming in to, for DIY. So it's the new homeowner or it's a new family because you, you're not going to have a family who's had their kids for five, 10 years because they've already probably got the stuff mm -hmm. you have in the new family or the new arrival to leads or the new X, Y, Z. I mean, people like the idea of borrowing instead of buying, but people don't come in because they're a greenie. They come in because they want to borrow instead. And yeah, most people, I think, borrow because they want to save money and there's nothing wrong with that. But that, I think that's the main motivation behind people doing it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they save money in carbon. So I promise, I think most people care more about money than they do about carbon. Mm. So what I'm thinking of in terms of potential downsides from a user perspective is, you know, the, the risk of it turning into like a software as a service kind of thing. But, you know, so you're paying a monthly amount for something that you're not necessarily using every month. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean. Well, but you, you, I disagree only because 90 95% of people don't make monthly donations. Yeah. So actually most people, and this is, we thought initially, I, like, I had this, I doesn't really matter, but I had an idea that people would all give us a little bit of money per month mm -hmm. and then use it occasionally. Mm -hmm. But people don't like to do that. People like mm -hmm. the idea of, you know, some people give us money because they believe in it and they just want to yeah. see it succeed. But yeah. some people, most people, 95% don't give us money per month and instead give us money when they borrow. So they feel like they're getting their money's worth yeah. by not paying for a service they're not using yeah. and paying when they do use it. And yeah. it's not a bad thing. It's just the nature of consumer habits. And mm. unfortunately that works because they give us enough money and they, they come in and use it. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have worked to have lots of people give us one or two pounds a month and then never use it because they yeah. don't, they're not getting their money's worth. So they don't use the, yeah. the solution is volume of people, <laughs> volume of items they borrow. That's the, that's the way it works. Mm. And most of the libraries find it the same way. Now, some people, most of the libraries do like a free membership and then you pay an explicit amount per item, or you do a monthly membership of 10, 20 pounds and then never have to pay at all. Whereas we're quite unique in that we have technically everything is paid as you feel. Mm. And so the membership is paid as you feel, and then you borrow and then you make a pay as you feel donation. So. Um, we are, you know, we, we could in theory make more money, but at the same time, it's about accessibility um, yeah. as well. Yeah. But, and if know. you go down the money route, then the, you just end up following that. Cause it's like, well, we're making more money. Well, we need to make more, more money and we need to make more, more money. And then yeah. the idea kind of falls away. I mean, it's a temptation, you know, if you're going down that route. I just think you need to make it, it needs to work at yeah. the end of the day. And, you know, I'll do what it takes to make the library work basically. Mm. Um, so that's the key thing because no one's going to benefit if it goes under, but, uh, yeah, it's about making the library work. Yeah. And unfortunately making the library work is usually the case of getting people to use the library because, yeah, mm. you know, most people give us enough money or sometimes give, give us more than we need or mm. make monthly donations, but don't use it. So mm. I'm not denigrating the system, but it is an experiment. It is kind of mm. treading on untrodden ground. It's a very unique model for lack of a better word. Yeah. Yeah. But it has gotten us a look, but on the other hand, you know, we've gotten for every downside there is to a pay as you feel model, there's actually a huge number of upsides because we have huge goodwill in the community from counselors and from MPs and from charities and from, you know, how I'm convinced that more people, we've been able to tell more people about us because it's pay as you feel that organizations who publicize are willing to tell people about it because there's no, people wouldn't tell people about a business which charges 20% because it, there's nothing nice about that. People yeah. are willing to tell us because we are nice. Does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because we're so nice, we get more publicity than if we were a bit meaner about pricing. Yeah. But people aren't going to support us because they'll say, oh, you're trying to advertise your business to make a quick buck. Yeah. Whereas this way, we have a huge amount of goodwill and we, you know, are able to, in theory, get more support from, say, grants or local government or from people. I'll go into the UBI question here and then, you know, and then we can kind of stay on both. So in terms of the, the teaching work, if there was a UBI, would you, would you still be teaching or would you give that up and dedicate full time to? 
Yeah, yeah, oh, like hundred ten percent, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, hundred ten percent. There's nothing wrong with teaching, but it's not. I have a huge problem to the education system, and mm. that's probably it. And so um, do most but, of the people that work in it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's hugely now. flawed. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with teaching a kid a thing. No. It's the mechanisms by which you teach it and how lessons are taught and how we judge success mm. is the key thing. It's how how do we judge that a teacher and a student has worked and how do we, what's a good way of phrasing it? What are we trying to achieve with education? Mm. Are we trying to get someone an A mm. by any means necessary mm. or are we trying to make them a wiser person who has shown that they're, they're mature and capable. Mm. And more importantly, if someone does get a D, that is, there's nothing inherently wrong with that because all that does is that proves this student is not mature, capable, X, Y, Z. Not or, everyone. Or has the time or capacity to, you know, it might be stuff at home that's just, they don't yes. have the capacity yes. for that. You know, like yeah. I don't have the mental space to think about this stuff at the moment. I've got more stuff going on. But then, yeah, but then that's not, and then that's not a problem with education. That's a problem with. Yeah. The social, yeah. So you, you, you deal with the consequences of so many problems mm -hmm. and it all, you know, we can all talk about underfunding and I, you know, I, you know, I, I'll probably put, I could get pretty, I'm not rad. I'll probably hold my tongue a bit, but, uh, mm. you know, I know, you know, a lot of people, you know, a fact is a fact is a lot of people are leaving education because mm. it's, it's not a terrible job now, like, yeah. because it's been so denigrated and the pay is like, I mean, you were saying the cost of living and stuff. I mean, it's like, you know, this is total media thinking. It's like, as if we didn't do, you know, over 10 years of austerity. And as if there wasn't, you know, sort of money printing at the top going on that whole time. And then when we go into COVID, they print more money than has been printed in the previous 10 <laughs> years. And then they're like, oh, you know, and it, and all of that money printing ultimately was to try and get some inflation, which they've now got, which is off the back of COVID. And now it's like, oh, no, now it's out of control. Yeah, but if we're, if we're talking about working, okay, here's my, I don't, have a, I don't have a particularly radical opinion about working your workers' rights, but I think. What's happened in a lot of professions is that people have lost sight of their ability and power as a worker mm -hmm. to achieve something by their action or inaction. And what I mean simply is industrial action striking. Mm -hmm. I think that we have completely, A, we've, we've had like, you know, 40 years of, um, you know, legislation to denigrate the power of unions. You've had at the same amount of time denigrating them in social media and in publicity. And then workers are then simultaneously surprised and they don't have as much power as they used to do. I mean, it's a complete, not farce, but, you know, I'm not going to say the word general strike, but, you know, people have so much power. And the mm. problem is, here's my, here's one of my opinions about workers and debt. Okay. Okay. I don't know what, I don't know how much each household is indebted to, like in terms of credit cards or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you if the state and your employer knows that you are, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. If they know that by, by, you know, the fact that society is indebted by this much, then they know they, the, the state businesses can outlast you in a strike. Mm. It, if you, if you, if you consumers are, you know, humble for a month, or, you know, if you prove to them that you can go on strike longer than that business can last on its savings, mm. then you have leverage over them by us. Removing leverage, we remove by us basically not having savings. We've removed power from ourselves mm. to get what we want. Mm. A set, uh, you know, it, people use the word safety net if you lose your job or if something bad happens. But it's also merely a safety net for if you don't like the situation, go on strike for a few weeks, eating your savings great, but they'll eat their savings even faster, mm. and then you can get the demands you want. Or that's one thing. But then also, you know. I don't, I generally don't understand why more people, I, I cannot understand why there aren't more strikes or more industrial action or more efforts to unionize in like fast food chains in the UK or, you know, any service sector. Um, it just, you know, boggles my mind. No, I, because, you know, there's an article about, sorry, can I talk about no, it? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it cheesed me off knowing there's an article in the BBC about the, um, teamsters in the U S and how the new boss of it was going to like say. You know, we're a sleeping giant yes. and that's, that's a fantastic article headline. But mm. the problem with it is every time you bring up unions, there's this like 
they make this inexorable, intrinsic link, link between it and organized crime and corruption, as if you cannot have a union without corruption. Mm. But then if you, if you have an article about some politician or some political party doing something, you wouldn't dare to then make the intrinsic association between politician and corruption because you'd say, oh, all the, all the politics is an aberration. All the, excuse me, all the corruption is actually an aberration of the normal operation of politics. Whereas we think that the normal operation of a union is like corrupt, feckless, um, you know, um, criminal elements. Mm. Whereas that's an aberration from the normal operation of a union. But we've intrinsically linked them but we haven't intrinsically linked crime and corruption with politicians because that's my problem with it. We, we weave the narrative about, about, um, organized, um, organized, um, labor mm. and who, who, you know, I'm not going to get, you know, um, um, conspiratorial, but who weaves the narratives that we, we live in. Okay. Who holds the power? Who's the, who the tells media. the story? Yeah. And who, you know, who's in charge of the media? Yeah. It's not, it's not work. You know, who, you know, how many publicly owned newspapers are there anymore? How many, you know, they're all owned, owned by, you know, large multinationals or, you know, the, the Murdoch press. Well, even, even on like, so if you think of when the sort of all the pamphleteering and stuff as newspapers were starting up. So there's always with any media that this massive explosion of democracy and pornography. Um, and then, you know, then it becomes enclosed and they sort of close it down. So like, they, you know, they brought in these taxes so that people couldn't just print pamphlets because it became more expensive so you had to have a big industrial printing press and so on and that was one of the ways that you can drive out sort of independent voices and now we've got this sort of you know the 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 commercial media is all sewn up and owned by offshore billionaires but there's this kind of diverse independent media but this diverse independent media is all on enclosed privatized spaces that can be quickly turned off or shut down or you know, sort of got rid of. So there is a lot of dynamism and there's a lot of voices, but there's a lot of voices that, you know, how independent and how free they are. It's, it's very debatable, I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, but then you get like, how could you get a democratized web network? Could you get, what's the, there's a word for it, isn't there? It's like um, a peer to peer networking. Mm. When it's like, instead of having a top down. Distributed or, web. Yeah. Like, exactly, distributed web. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a distributed web, then you can no longer have you know, if every, if everyone's computer is a node mm. and you connect that way, rather than it all have to be centralized to nodes, mm. that would be then, you then be unable to shut down it as effectively because it's communicated through network to network to do PC to PC to PC. Mm. So that's really, and actually was a, can I, sorry, I'm mean, there's like, there's a thing in the Soviet Union. Have you ever heard of, it's like a Soviet Union internet that happened in the seventies. Um, and they, um, are you thinking of cyber sin? I am. Yeah. And they shut it down because yeah, it made that's the Chile, it's in easy. Chile. But there was one in the Soviet yeah. Union as well. All right. Yeah, I mean, think it was, um, um, yeah, it was a, a nationwide information network and then it was denied funding. I suspect, and it was because it would have made peer to peer, um, communication too easy. Mm. Um, so people don't like it when you're able to communicate with each other directly. Well, you powerful know? people don't like it because if people can get together and talk and organize, then I mean, they yeah, can why threaten did, their power. Yeah. Why did Mubarak shut down the, um, the Wi-Fi and internet networks in the Arab Spring in Egypt and stuff like that. Why is that mm. the first thing that goes down? Mm. You know, it's because, you know, you know, organized people are affected and they don't want them organized. Mm. They want them divided and separated. And but that, that, that's the thing affected. that's scary. That, that, that's the thing that, that bothers them. It's people being organized. Um, you know, and then that, that's where, that's where all the stories will start appearing because it's that, it's the fear of a good example sort of thing. That's kind of covered UBI in a roundabout way. Well, <laughs> we, we haven't actually talked about UBI in anything, actually. <laughs> I'd like to talk more about UBI. Go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, oh, I love it. I think it's the best. It, I, and there's huge flaws of it, but I think that what, the way I see it, again, it's about lowering barriers to energy because I don't think that when everyone goes on UBI, they just quit their jobs and like, no. oh, this is the good life. What it does is it allows people the financial freedom to pursue a project, a passion project, with the intention of hopefully making money from it. There's nothing inherently wrong with quitting a job and then doing something to better get a better career, mm. but it's risky to do that if you don't have this safety net. Yeah. And so what, what a UBI would do is allow people to work less and have more time to do something which does eventually have better economic impact. Now, there's three examples I always love, which are like UBI secretly or like UBI that, that, that work. Okay, there's mm. three. Do you know how J.K. Rowling wrote um, Harry Potter? 
She was on benefits at the exactly. time. Exactly. She was on yeah. benefits. And because she was pregnant, I think, or something. So had she not been able to get, you know, relatively nice benefits from being pregnant, she wouldn't have written um she wouldn't have written JK uh, the Harry Potter thing, which is you know I mean countless billions of, of pounds. Okay. Uh how, what did um what did Isaac Newton not Isaac Newton? What did um Albert Einstein do uh when he wasn't coming up with universal theories? Uh, patent office. He was a Swiss patent clerk and he said that his job was just boring enough or just interesting enough that he wasn't, that he would do it and then still have the energy to go home mm. and do stuff on physics. Practically, in my opinion, UBI. He didn't do, he didn't do that for a, a low of it. He did it to, because it was just stimulating enough that you could then go on to do um, stuff at home. Okay. Henry Cavendish. Do you know Henry Cavendish? Know the name. He basically came up with the gravitational constant, so 9.8 meters per, per second per second. He came with, no, he came up with big G, I think. And he came up with this fantastic experiment for gravity. Do you know how he's able to do it? He was basically a, a man of legend. Okay. He, he, he had an inherited law of land and mm. gentry land. Mm. And so it was a pursue exactly what he wanted to, which hopefully, which coincidentally was, was just, a, oh, another great one. Okay. How, you know, um, Nell Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. How did she, do you know how she was able to write that? Christmas one year, her friend gave her a year's salary instead of her gut. She was a teacher and said, here's a year's salary, write your book. Mm. And then hundreds of millions of people have read it. And it's, you know, a fantastic thing to addition to the, to the universe. Okay. Now I'm sure this cat, those are the ones that I can, now those aren't UBI in a cap, in a, in a capital U, capital B, capital I, but they are tantamount to someone having the freedom to do exactly what they want and then having a, a, a net societal economic gain. I'm sure there's lots of people who tried that and failed, mm. but I'm sure that the, the gains that we've seen from those mm. outweigh the failures because then they just have to go back to doing something else. So I love them. I think, pardon? I was going to say, you could put it as, um, you know, if the state was paying you to be productive rather than to exist, you know, like it made the basic assumption that if you have the ability to be productive, you will be productive. So they pay you so that you have that ability to be productive and then industry and business could only benefit from that because yeah. if people would be coming up with ideas and new businesses and so on and so forth yeah. and be able to you know spend time on things that are business problems that you can't necessarily you know like a lot of businesses don't always have the capacity to do that thing that big piece of work that needs doing it's like we haven't got the staff we should bring someone in we can't afford to do that people were working less so that they were working more effectively and then on that sort of spare time, they can work on those other projects, things like that. So it's, it's about freeing up capacity and like actually, you know, releasing that potential. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's also, it, it, it sits upon this assumption though, that, you know, I came up with a, I had a debate once and I said like, so she, I was debating someone and said, you know, oh, if you give UBI, they'll just sit on the couch all the time. Okay. And then what, what, no, but that, no, but you and I wouldn't. No, no, but then you flip it. No, 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 you flip it because this is what you say to them. Yeah. Well, what's wrong with that? No, 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 not even that. Because what you say is that she said that you're the average person will just uh, take it and sit on a couch and just do nothing all day. And then you ask them, you say, oh, do you think you're a pretty normal person? You know, you've, you're, you know, you make an average amount of money. You know, you're, you're X, Y, Z, you're pretty average too. And then you, and then they hopefully would agree because they are, this person was right. thinking of it. Yeah. So then you say, well, if you think you're average and you think the average, would you sit on the sofa and say, oh, no, I do something worthwhile with my time. So there's your point. Is it mm. most people are pretty average and that's not a bad thing. It's most people have, you know, brain of this size and have limbs of this and have this and this and this, and they all want to do something worthwhile and good with their time. Mm. And so you, if you base society, if you base the assumption on most people being good because you are good and you are average, then that's the assumptions that you run with. And you, you, the other thing, I, you know, I don't know how. Uh, no one said to me a dollar figure that, you know, this is what they would get per month, but mm. it's not in my, in either way I say it, it's not enough to like, you know, have a Ferrari. It's just like just enough that you can scrape by, um, and do a passion project or just enough to scrape by. And then you work 20 hours instead of 40 hours, something like that. So that's how I would, would see it, it was just enough that you can get by, but not enough that you could thrive. It's a survive, but not thrive. And then you use the time, which is the key thing, in my opinion, and I don't know, an investment from a social enterprise funder and X, Y, Z to then do the thing. Mm -hmm. But then the, 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 the counter argument or the, the, the other avenue of UBI and U, is UBS, universal basic services. Yeah, yeah. So you obviously, instead of 
a dollar amount, you give people, you know, room, board, food, um, education, buses, stuff like that. Um, instead, um, and that one just, it doesn't sit as elegantly with me because it's people know what they want to spend their own money on. Now, granted that might be bad things, but, um, uh, UB, UBI in theory sounds fair to me. Have you read, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed? Uh, I have not, fortunately. You should read it. It's really good. Um, mm -hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of it. Um, d -d 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 okay. So are we done with UBI? Do you think? Um, yeah, I think so. That, those are my, I just like those anecdotes about what I think were ye olde UBI mm -hmm. and all the great things that have come from someone having the financial freedom to do exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's other ones that we can't think of right now, but those are the best. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a sort of, it's like a Goldilocks zone, isn't it? Of, of giving people the capacity and ability to kind of do the thing, but then not giving them too much so that they can become like, you know, egomaniac self indulges <laughs> like you need those restrictions you need i think you need to have problems and have challenges and things to solve and things that you need to you know apply yourself to work around mm -hmm. so it's i mean obviously they're never going to pay you that much and it wouldn't work anyway because all the prices it go the, to hell the payment but... the payment is it's not a payment to make you less productive it's a payment to make you more productive yeah it, it, it's, it's making a mechanism to make you the best you can be yeah that's, that's, I mean, how many, you know, most people in the UK go to university or on UBI for three years. Mm. We are paying them an amount of money to become a more productive person. Mm. Where's the student loan? If not, that is a grant it's a loan, not a UBI, but it used to be a grant, didn't it? Because, um, they recognized that the money in was worth it to make this wonderful, educated, skilled person on the other end. You know, what is a you know, grant the apprenticeships technically paid? My point is, is. You know, is that not UBI? You're unproductive for three years. You are not doing anything of worth apart from learning something and gaining skills. You mm. can't apply them yet. Mm. Is that not UBI in a, in a, in a, in a manner of speaking? Mm. Mm. So it's all about making you the best that you can be. Um, I mean, the other, the other thing as well that we've not mentioned here is care, care work. And that that would help massively in a giving people the time to provide care and take off some of that pressure and actually monetize some of that care. You know, because so much of the state runs on all this, you know, free care, whether it's from family or whether it's from people who are being underpaid for providing care. Like if that wasn't going on, the economic activity that exists on top of it couldn't go on either. Yes. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. yeah. A lot of economic benefits do sit upon unwaged or underpaid labor, don't they? Yeah. Um, do you know about the, the scheme in Leeds called like, it's like rent, borrow my room or like share my house. And it's like, you basically, you've got like, um, a, a, an old, an older person or a person with disabilities who has a house. Yep. And then I've you seen, are, yeah, I've you seen person, similar before. Yeah. You have a person who doesn't have a house, but you know, relatively skilled. Mm. And then they rent a room for free for like 10 hours of, of labor a week. Mm. That to me is like tantamount to UBI. But you know, if you get back to UBI's, what, if we come back to this idea of making productivity easier, mm. you know, does, does a, you know, if we're universal basics um, does a library fit to that somewhere does mm. you know does um does uh a, a normal book library sit into that and does the you know wikipedia sit into mm. you know we're making all these things accessible we're making mm. your time accessible mm. you, you know i'd love to eventually be able to have like a 3d printer service at the library where you mm. could send us stuff to print yeah. or send us you know stuff that needs to be on a cry cut or needs to be or make your own badges for the thing so you know, we, you get the time by having UBI, but you get all the resources for, for tantamount to free by having the library. And then those things together means you can eventually make, um, you know, a, a productive or a service that people want to consume. Mm. Um, so that's good. I, mean, I guess. Have you thought of a library of resources yet of like, you know, sort of getting into the, the waste disposal and reclaiming? <laughs> no, we're, we, we don't, I don't have them because there's a lot of like hazard stuff you have to deal with yeah, yeah, yeah. that if you really do dispose of waste now there's actually a few places in leeds that already do that so there's scrap in Farsi, which is called like yeah, yeah. surplus creative resources um then there's obviously seagulls there's obviously the revive centers in kirkstall and in seacroft they are a dump or an hmrc a household waste recycling center but then they re they redirect some of the usable stuff to a shop 
But I don't think we have the one thing that I think is quite cool that no other library does is we have a scheme called take a screw, leave a screw. We got all these screws and I wanted them, but we got all these screws and nails and washers and bolts and zip ties and elastic bands and all these kind of nibbly consumer bits donated because how many people want to do a bit of DIY, but don't want to buy an entire bag of yeah. screws and nails. It's, it's yeah. stupid in my opinion. So we have that in addendum to all the screwdrivers, all the drill bits, all the bit drivers and the power drill. So you could, we're literally a one-stop shop at a fraction of the price for all the stuff you need. Mm. Now we won't have every single thing you need, but we've got quite a lot of, quite a lot of screws and nails now. Uh, mm. And they go out every, every few weeks you get someone picking up a screw or a nail because, you know, it's, um, I don't know, it just works sometimes. Yeah. Um, but that's where I'd love to be is a, you know, like maybe one day we'll have a little workshop in it. So you don't want to have to take all the tools to your place, you can just take them to us and do an X, Y, Z quickly, mm. or we might have, you know, a tool exchange or a, a, a toy exchange or a clothes exchange from the, um, from the room next door, or we might have seed exchanges. I thought about being able to do like a plant exchange sent mm. to the part or a, yeah. And this, we don't, this is tangential, but do you know about the Leeds time bank? Do you know Leeds time bank? I, I, I'm sort of, uh, trying to be involved I, like my name is on the thing for creative time bank leads but I, is there another one as well no is that not the same thing these creative time banks yeah, yeah 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 there that's a pretty cool resource which i really like the idea of is that if you don't have money but you do have a skill you can exchange skills and exchange of money mm. um so but then if we want to talk more about borrowing um can we segue to borrowing sure yeah <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm abandoning most of my questions, but you know, like this is stuff that's interesting and that you want to talk about, and it is work related. This is something that you're doing work wise. It's a, a business that you're starting, so it's it's all valid stuff, I think. Well, I want to what what I think what I really advocate for as well as borrowing from us is borrowing things widely. So there are so many things that you can borrow, like there's car share, which is like when you borrow a car instead of buying your own for a big job or task as a car share app. And I'm not, I'm not plugging these to make money. These are just things I think are neat. There's car share. There's, um, blah, blah, blah car, which is a, like a, basically a hitchhiking app, which mm -hmm. I think is a brilliant idea. But there's also peer to peer borrowing apps as well. So there's one called Fat Llama, Street Bank, Olio has one, um, Free Eagle has one too. We upload an item that you own in your home and are willing to lend. Mm -hmm. And then you put a price or not to it. And then you tell the community about it and then you lend it to them and then they bring it back. So. Mm. Also, library serves a great purpose. It can't have everything, nor can it solve all problems, nor can there be a library everywhere for everyone. Mm. So I think peer-to-peer -peer lending, you know, could make, you know, activities easier as well. Mm. Um, that's really cool in my opinion. There's like borrow my dog. So say you've got a, a, a going away for a weekend, you can lend your dog to someone mm. and they're like, oh, I get to have a fun dog for the weekend. And then mm. you bring it back. And there's also like baby clothes that you can borrow because and maternity, maternity clothes you can borrow because you don't use them very often. You know, they you get used in nine months and you use something else. Baby toys as well. There's like a toy subscription, baby clothes. I said already, but just clothes in general, like women's nice clothes or clothes in general, you can borrow a really nice outfit instead of buying and stuff like that. And that's peer to peer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're talking about like resources and a community bank, then yeah, we can do a lot of the library, but we aren't all the solutions to all the problems. Mm -hmm. That's, and that's not an insult. It's just. There's so many great resources that you can use to make your lives easier. There's already a Leeds urban harvest place where they lend out apple pressing equipment mm. to you to make your own apple juice or cider and stuff like mm. that. So, you know, we, uh, you know, there's just great stuff going on. I just love it. I just love the idea of borrowing instead of buying and, and making people's lives easier and mm. cheaper by just simply using the resources we have more effectively. We have enough stuff. There is enough food in the universe. There is enough stuff. It's just about putting the stuff where it needs to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's distribution. Yes. It's all, yeah, it's distribution. Um, so climate change question. I mean, obviously with, uh, the library of things that's very sustainability focused. I mean, do you like, do you have like a, a sort of green policy or an agenda with that of, of or do you kind of review your impact and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we, um. I wouldn't say, we have a, I mean, the policy is, you know, borrow, borrow instead of buy, but yeah. the kind of outcome of it is we, the, the software we use is quite sophisticated. Um, and I, I, I do a few calculations with it. So it'll spit out 
total number of loans. What it'll also generate is, is every item on average is worth 20 pounds. Okay, so you total up all the items to have a total thing, 20 pounds. And I used to do a calculation, which is basically number of loans times by 20 pounds equals money saved. And that would be the total money we saved. I also then would do another calculation, which is that for every uh, one pound saved is one kilo of carbon. And I used a carbon footprint calculator to get to that kind of conversion rate. Mm -hmm. And so I used to say basically one, and it was just fortuitous that that happened. But number of loans times 20 equals money saved. Money saved pretty much equals tons saved. So for every thousand pounds saved is one ton of carbon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that's fine, but it's inaccurate because we aren't lending the average item every time mm. people, we have a huge, we, the most expensive item we have is 500 pounds, uh, seven, uh, yeah, 500 pounds. The least expensive is like 50 P in terms of like price new. Um, but people aren't bought because, because 50 P one pound, two pound, three pound up to 10 people are okay with spending money on it. Mm. Okay. So those things don't get let out. So my average is actually an underestimate because we're not lending the average thing. We're actually lending the high, high mark. Okay. So a better one is you multiply whatever you make each weekend by, so you do, you multiply the money you make every weekend is how much, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If we charge 10%, which we, we roughly do, then you times that by 10 to get the, the cost saving. And then that number is your carbon saving. So every weekend we, well, this weekend we save people well over a thousand pounds probably close to 2000, certainly 1500 pounds this weekend. Mm -hmm. And so that's 1500 pounds and 1.5 tons of carbon because we got in about 110. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we really save people close to, to 2000 pounds and, um, to two tons of carbon. So we've saved people, we've done 600 loans and we've probably saved people at least 16,000 pounds and mm -hmm. 16 tons of carbon. Um, Which is in a good result. seven months. Yeah. Yeah. Now it'll be a bit less than that because you've got the, you know, the inherent cost of driving to and from us. Yeah. yeah I was going to say you were the scope. In yeah. Like, you're and the you've cost. got like, they didn't save, they didn't save a hundred pounds because they made us a five pound donation to that. She saved 95. Mm. So, I mean, it's still better than, you know, it's great, but it's, it's yeah. coarse and no one's really got a really good way to crack it in other libraries yet. I mean, people say they've served 50,000 pounds or 60 or 70. Mm. Um, and I know how they calculate that sometimes, but they, um, but they've been going a lot longer than we have, but you know, it's might be near to 20, cause every last month, last two months, really, we save people at least one and a half thousand pounds every weekend. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been at least 6,000 every weekend for the last two months. So it might be close to, I really can't say it might be close to 20,000 pounds. We've saved people or higher still. Mm. That's it really. Yeah, um, that's a good result. So I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm going to take it to the teaching side. So, um, I mean, is there anything that you can do in the, well, like in your teaching role, um, to address sort of climate change and so on? I know that the government, well, I saw on online, I didn't look at the story. I saw the headlines saying that they're going to teach like a natural history thing or create a requirement to teach natural history within the curriculum. Um, I don't know if you've come across that story but yeah i mean is there anything is there anything that you can do as a teacher to kind of address climate change i mean and... the science syllabus has you know quite a lot of the chemistry syllabus which i teach does cover climate change mm. um and the carbon cycle and about pollution over time and the source of pollution and the consequences of pollution mm. um but uh it doesn't really it's very, it's not, it's fun. I think it's fun. It's very, it's very unbiased. It's very, um, just clear, concise information, evidence-based mm -hmm. and the facts of the matter of what is pollution, how is it generated? Mm. It doesn't necessarily deal with, and it deals with these really like superficial solutions. Like why don't we drive less? Mm. Why don't we, you know, travel on planes less? Mm. It's these really kind of bone solutions. Why don't we redesign our economy? Cause we're yeah, not allowed to. <laughs> why don't we recycle more? It's like, these are kind of like 20th century problems to 20th century solution, uh, 20th century solutions to 20th century problems. But mm -hmm. yeah, it won't, it's not too challenging or it doesn't, you can't really bike too much, but then, you know, you teach it and it's school is a bit dry inherently or the, but it never really resonate. I mean, you know, you talk about like the youth and like the Greta Thunbergs, but our kids don't okay. care about much basically at that point. <laughs> <laughs> It's not really meant to be exciting. Um, I don't think it's not. I don't 
it's hard to get people revved up about it because the problem i think when you're you're so you're such a consumer when you're that age like mm. whether we like or not we act, i bought probably more clothes in my teens than i have in my 20s mm. um because i you know you feel a lot of peer pressure and a lot of like influences and stuff like that so you're i think you're reconciling a quite tough you're issue. you're you're at the peak of it because most advertising is is geared towards you and like you know and advertisers are specifically looking for things that you're looking at and being involved with because you're the biggest kind of disposable income group for you know consumables so yeah you're you're going to be the most indoctrinated in terms of and you're yeah you're very easy to influence that age as well yeah yeah go on and you know and the, the thing about school is like if you you you've got a kid for five hours a day and a, a fraction of that is is science and so it's hard to compete with society who influences them for the other um, you know, 19 hours of the day. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think there are problems with the way that advertising works, the way it's phrased, who it's targeted to, mm. you know, how other people explain climate change and solutions to it and stuff like that. So I think while syllabus is pretty benign and good, there are other influences that cannot be escaped from the wider world, mm. advertising, um, consumerism, stuff like that which i think yeah. is deleterious to people's um ability to um you know do things which are better for the planet because if you're taught that your self-worth comes from what you wear and what you look like and what you buy then mm. you're gonna do that instead now, i think it's kind of like to a fundamental about like human nature i think that more people care about money than care about abstract like why the climate change is no more severe now than it was six months ago but what has happened is that the there's been overriding problem of the of the um financial problems every time it acts, I think really bad. I think that actually climate change stuff comes into the fore when there's a lull in other problems. Mm. I think actually one of those problems which is only a problem when you've got no other problems. Mm. People aren't concerned with what's going to happen in 20, 30 years time. If mm. they're concerned what's going to happen in two weeks time. Okay. But they're not, they're not making the link that these problems are coming from the problem, the, the overarching problem that we've refused to address for the whole past three decades. You know, it's like, okay, so there's an increase in mental health problems. There's an increase in like inequality. There's an increase in like truth in media. There's more corruption. There's more this, there's more money printing. There's more this, like, and it's like climate change. Oh, there's more wars. You know, all of the stuff, like I remember learning, you know, sort of doing climate change in school in the nineties and it was kind of right. It'll be more authoritarian. There'll be mass migrations. There'll be resource wars. There'll be, you know, like you'd be verging towards fascism and all of these kind of things. And it's like, you know, it's not in the future. It's now, but it it doesn't look how we imagine a lot of these things, you know. And and you, people you aren't necessarily link. making the link. I mean, why did the war? The war in Syria happened. Had a really bad harvest the year before yeah. it happened. And food, yeah. there were food shortages. Yeah, and that was because of of, of man made or in some way climate change. And yeah, I and think a lot the of the happened. Yes, the the Arab Spring in general, you know, like that was to do with the rise in food prices. Yeah, yeah like underlying. Prices. I mean, obviously, there's like you know all the the, the historical and political reasons, but the, the kind of drive was that massive rise in food yeah. prices. But it, but I think that whilst they're related, I'm not denying that. But it's not as it's very hard to like you see a problem of a war. It's harder to quickly say, oh that happened because of the food. They they there's a gap between them and. Mm. The, the thing of the, t like, it, it, you know, climate change has a factor in war, but war itself is obviously a bigger headline than the climate change, which leads to war. Uh, but the point I'm trying to get is, is like, I distinctly remember there was a big, I remember in my head, at least there's a lot to do with sustainability before the great recession in 2008. Mm. In my mind, I remember that people came up talking about a lot more. As soon as the recession comes, people talk about that instead. Mm. Okay. Then. You know, the climate change stuff really came to a fore in 2019, 2020 mm. um, with the XR because the, whether we like it or not, things were okay at that point. Mm. Okay. It wasn't great, but it wasn't like this dramatic thing that coronavirus was. So I think, unfortunately, climate change only really comes to the fore when there isn't a more pressing, immediate problem, be that war, famine, mass inflation. And that's not a bad thing. So people care more about putting food in their plate today than they care about pollution in five years time or whatever much time is that's that's what people are really concerned about and they're only concerned with the long-term problems and that's not denigration it's like maslow's hierarchy of needs mm. you know 
if you've got your basic needs net, then you can focus on bigger things. Mm. UBI, really. Mm. You know, if you've got your basic needs met uh, economically, then you can care about climate change. Mm. Um, so, and no one's going to say the word degrowth right now. I mean, there are they. And that's because it's easy to misinterpret degrowth. But, um, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, we should have a, you know, let's buy less stuff. But right now, when buying stuff is important so people don't lose their jobs, you're going to really advocate for buying stuff. But again, it's, it's not, it's not that everyone has to stop buying less stuff. You know, you know, that the, the, the most conspicuous consumption again is up, up at the top. They, like you said earlier, a large part of it is just loss of power, you know, loss of power within the public. We have lost a lot of our, our power to kind of affect things and change things, or at least, well, no, I would say it's perceived, but I would also say it's real as well. And then, you know, the issues of money and then people kind of you know, having to deal with the more material basic things. And then there's a lack of organization to kind of grow, you know, like the fact that food banks have just been growing, for example, that shouldn't be happening and it shouldn't become a kind of long-term solution. But then at the same time, then, well, are you building a library of food kind of thing through that network? Is that, is that the next economy coming into being? So yeah, I mean, but I think that we will see a catalyzation of lots of things through this decade, as we already did from COVID, you know, that, that, that sped huge parts of work onto doing things remotely and things that, you know, like loads of businesses who would never have thought that that was possible for them. And then they've tried it and then they're like, all right, well, we're going to do this now because it's going to save us money. So you get all those changes driven by other factors as well. I sometimes have a problem with people when people say like loss of locus of control or like, you know, when you think, I think that, I think that people have a lot more power than they think they do to me. Oh, absolutely. Action in their lives. And I think mm. what, what irks me is you know, there's that quote, which is like 71% of all emissions come from a hundred companies. Mm. Have you dig it? Have you seen that statistic? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the, that, the point being that, oh, I, I didn't do it because I'm, I'm just a little, I'm just a little consumer of me. It's all these bad companies that did. Well, if you look at what they are it's like saudi aramco and china coal are the top two it's like mm. well you are definitely yeah. getting petrol <laughs> in your car and you're definitely buying something from a chinese factory which used coal to burn it so it is your fault because you have bought from these people mm. so it's it's what we do is we say oh you know or the and also the bp i really hate that people really slang off the bp carbon calculate it's like oh i you know i put out 10 tons of carbon in my life but at least i didn't dump billions of tons of oil in the ocean mm. with, now, your desire for affordable petrol meant that the um, regulation and the um, putting in of oil rigs was in that area. So your actions, be small, do contribute to these large perceived external people doing it. Mm. You have arguments like, you know, people have these huge things about like, oh, what can I do? I'm just a little consumer. Well, you could, I don't know, not use uh, cars. You could insert your home better. You could not buy as much meat. You could buy secondhand clothes. You could not buy clothes full stop. You could buy reusable um, or buy uh, refill shop stuff instead of buying it from packaging. You could mm. use a library instead. You could, so, you know, we can do things and we are doing things. Yeah. And, um, you know, you could. Doesn't that go that. back to the problem initially of, you know, like you saying that the, um, the lockdown gave you that thinking space and gave you the time to make the decisions of, I want to work like this. Like if you've got, a mortgage and however many kids and however many pet pets and whatever to pay for every month and you're doing 35 hours a week then wh whether you've got the energy left at the end of that to you know go into the supermarket and not use any plastic and buy everything organic and do you know yeah. what i mean Is no i know that, I, that's, yeah it then comes back to that material sort of like it's, it's oh, i'm too exhausted yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. this is the problem because i i love the idea of a resale shop but i very rarely use them because i go to one shop and I like to put all my shop stuff in that one shop. Yeah, get I'd it love done, it if yeah. there's a reef. I'd love there's a refill section in normal supermarkets. Then I would be much more inclined to use it. Or, you know, what else are you going to say? But then I think someone that would like just the absence of doing. So I think like, you know, don't buy that dress you're going to wear once, mm. or borrow it instead, or you know, um, consume less meat, or don't drive your car as much, or mm. get an electric car. I mean, those are really expensive actually, but. I think that everyone in the UK, I've got a theory about insulation and about saving carbon and money. Okay, I've got my, here's my theory about insulation. People will say insulate Britain, and I, I completely agree with their goals, but do you know how easy it is to put in loft insulation? Mm. Do you know, most people probably don't have very good loft insulation. They've got probably like, you know, 
you know, a terraced house or a, um, a semi-detached or whatever, and they probably don't have great loft insulation. But do you know, the act of putting in insulation is so, I've done it because I've, for, for work, I've installed insulation because I want to know more about it and I like sustainability. So I did it with um, a company called um, Sure Insulation, who are a Leeds-based in, in, um, insulation retrofit company, and they're great. And it took us like a day to install it, okay? And then we're going to save that house hundreds of pounds a year in money and carbon because of a day of labor from two people. Now, granted, you had to buy the insulation, you had to have the kit to install it, but what's to stop you, you know, getting a loan? I'd love it if leaves, if, if some credit union or some, you know, bank was able to offer like, yeah, I'll keep talking, but this is, am I making, am I doing something? Am I going too off tangent? No, 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 I think it's, I think it's related. Okay, so I, if you're talking about like, if we're talking about individual actions, okay, we, we're all petitioning to them and saying, oh, please insure, please insure our houses, please. No, you could, you could, um, Get a loan to buy the insulation. And I'd love it if some like, there's some like really low interest company that would give a loan specifically for insulation of homes. Then you borrow the equipment needed to install the insulation from your local library, us, and then you install it yourself. And then you save money every month, year, and you slowly pay off the loan that you use to buy the, the, roll, the rolls of insulation, borrowed the stuff, and then you save money in the long term. And you've done it mm-hmm. all yourself. And to me, it's, you know, you could do loft insulation. You could probably possibly do cavity wall, but I'd be really wary of, it, of a non-expert doing that. You could certainly do your uh, draft proofing. You could possibly do underfloor, but underfloor is really tedious to do. You could certainly get a loan to buy those reflector films to go behind your radiators. Mm. And you could just buy them, frankly. They're, about, they're not very expensive. But, you know, with a few hundred pounds and a few hours of work, few Mm. days of work, Mm. you could make your home so much more um, environmentally friendly and carbon saving, Mm. but people don't like the idea of doing it themselves. They want someone else to do it for them Mm. Um, or they can't afford to do it. Fair enough. But that's why, but you're going to save money in the long term. You can invest in it because it's, it's an investment. It's investing in yourself. Mm. You invest in yourself and then you save money for, for for ad for night and afterwards. It'd be great if like a loan company or a credit union or a whatever building society could like offer a small loan specifically for, for insulation stuff to do that. That to me would be a really good way of empowering people to make the right decisions. A great way of empowering people to make the right decisions would be, you know, supermarkets having refill sections in them or, you know, having, you know, councils or people promoting borrowing networks or promoting libraries where they are. And that, those are my opinions on how we solve the climate crisis is you empower individuals to make the, the correct actions themselves. Mm. Um, and you make it, you make it easier to make the right decision and harder to make the wrong decision. Yeah. yeah. I mean that, that in itself sounds like a social media post to me of like a reel of come to library of things. Here's the equipment that you need to do your loft installation. We can provide this. Here are the other people that do this. Like how, what's your, what's your kind of social media strategy and how much, how much time does that take up? And do you think that that time creates enough benefit for you? (laughs) <laughs> that's a million dollar question. Mm. Um, the last time I'm saying about insulation, um, is we, I want to get a thermal imaging camera for the library mm. and then you could borrow that to find the hot spots or the cold mm-hmm. spots in your house to, so you can insulate it more effectively or to find out just how bad it is. Yeah. 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 That, and then I would go with the package. So you find the, the hot spots in anyway, it. That's something I'd love to get to make mm. it easier for people to insulate them and find the, the, the problems and show them that the problems, and that's something a library can do because they're 500 pounds to buy, 400 pounds to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can definitely borrow it. And it's a social media. Okay. So my broad strategy is tell people about good things and tell people about us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not, I got, I'm not gonna use the word viral, but we, we, I've done one or two like deliberately funnier viral things to get attention, but it's just, I wouldn't say it's boring, but it's just. You know, it's, it, for lack of better words, an advertisement. We tell people what we have mm. and how they can use what we have. I mean, if I scroll through our Facebook, no, I'll just, is that all right? I'm just going to scroll through my yeah, Facebook. Sure, yeah. So like today or yesterday, we posted about the fantastic um, Headingly Repair Cafe that's going to happen in a few weeks mm-hmm. um, at the, um, the Heart Center, which is really near us. And that's, you know, what's great about that is because people go to it and then 
will probably pop along and advocate to come to the library to borrow stuff so they can do this without the repair cafe next time. So it's mutually beneficial. We showed off all the stuff we have for the Jubilee party. We showed off a new investment fund for sustainable projects in Headingley recently, um, which is a grant. So what's great is that, you know, people give money to it and then it helps more sustainable projects where we are. So it's, it's mutually beneficial. Um, pizza oven post, we showed off new donations. We like do feed up reports on how well the library's going. So we did a big one on our sixth month anniversary weekend and how well it's going. Mm -hmm. Then we showed off our new projector, badge maker. So it's, you know, sometimes we show and like seasonal stuff. So it's like I said, we showed off stuff about Easter stuff, showed off about party stuff, mm. well-being week. This is a passion project of mine. I showed off about the, do you know, I'm um, Tom Lehrer, the singer who did Poisoning Pigeons in the Park and the Element song that nope. Daniel Radcliffe covered on um, Graham Norton. Okay. There's Antimony, Arsic, Aluminum, and Selenium, Nitrogen, Oxygen, Nitrogen, Redium. All right, yeah. That's the tune of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> I love Tom Lair and he put all of his work in the public domain recently so that people could use it, perform it, edit it, play yeah. it yeah. without paying royalty fees. And that sings to the part of me which likes lowering barriers to entry. And yeah. so I did it selfishly because I want someone to put on a Tom Lair show that I would yeah. go to. So yeah. you know, it's just about telling people about things that I think are good basically, um, you know, the tie into the ideology of the library. So we advocate for a lot of borrowing, borrowing apps, yeah. various other networks nearby, yeah. various things that we're going to or want people to go to instead. Yeah. So that, that's how I use it. It's a, you know, a podium, you know, we've got yeah. 4,000 followers on our Facebook and 1,000 a bit on Instagram and then 700 on, on Twitter. Mm. So we're not great, but we're not, we're not bad. No, you're doing well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in six months I've been around what two and a half years i've got about 300 followers on twitter and instagram but you know but i you're a, you're i mean you're a broader market you're gonna sort of hit and I, people I, I needed it i needed that to happen so the library would grow yeah. It, it, yeah it was in my the library's interest to i had to make it work to make the yeah. library work yeah you know we we do good things and obviously like we'll share stuff that so if we got the bbc we'll share the bbc stuff if we eat on x we'll go to y so it, Mm. You know, it's just, you know, for lack of a better word, it's just a narrative of, of what we are doing mm. um, yeah. and what we are getting. Does it um, take up too much time or is it? No, I mean, I actually, it's something I can very easily put off Yeah, and that's bad. So some things I can't put off and so do them, but social, like in my head, I've got at least 10 posts that mm. I know I could post mm. um, that would actually make us, more people come to us and use us. Mm -hmm. and you know, be, be beneficial. There's at least, or, or things I know that we could do for social media. So I used to try and post like, but it's, you know, a busy social media week is actually does take up a lot of your time. Yeah. Cause you have to like, what's annoying is you have to like, take the photo you, in my head. If I've got a post idea, then you have to assemble the stuff, take the photo, put it on the computer, upload it, and then do it on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, the, each individual bit isn't very long, but all of them together three times a week is quite long yeah. and it's, it's also that the come to come up with the idea, you have to exist on social media. Yeah. And so you have to see what other people are doing and what you could, what you can follow or what you can share, what you can. So even if, even if the share button is two clicks to find the thing to share yeah. is time. Yeah. So, but I largely enjoy it. And I, I like the idea of it's, I like the challenge of growing something. I like the idea of, oh, this is a good idea. So classic example, there's something in Meanwood called the big bunting challenge. Okay. And they've got like a Twitter and um, a Facebook or a, a, an Instagram and they're making a load of bunting to put up over Meanwood for some reason. And I thought nothing of it. And I thought, well, they're sewing. Why don't they borrow our sewing machines to make their bunting thing work? Mm. Or like if, you know, if there's a, a festival like Kirkstall Valley Festival or Gledho Valley Farm Festival, then I'll see them on social media and I'll think, Hey, they're having a festival. They probably need gazebos and stuff like that. I'll tell them to use our library to make this happen. So it's the act of browsing and you can see what people are doing, then you can like intercept basically. Mm. So you almost like weaponize it or you use it as a tool for growth. Mm. We follow someone to, to know that you exist. So the act of yeah. following someone puts you in their notifications. And they think, oh, that's interesting. I'll follow them back. Yeah. So you have to like weaponize it as a tool of growth. 
Yeah. I mean, I, the, my next question was, do, do you think you would have been like, would you be this far ahead without social media? Would you have got this far? Or do you think? No, I, not, yeah. not, not, no, no, no way whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, no, no way whatsoever. I mean, every time I post something on Facebook in like another page, then like, you know, there was a day where we got like 200 followers in like one day because mm. I post on some of this stuff. Mm. It is by far and away the cheapest easiest way of getting people to know about the library yeah advertisement costs money paper advertising costs time and money mm. and resources where social media is fast it's efficient you know why do you you know what i didn't get on the bbc because i, I wanted to go on the bbc i knew that if i got on the bbc we would get in my head i thought we'd get 20 percent more members we yeah. got about 10 percent more but it took an hour and a half of my time i called them a few times and i emailed them a few times like an hour and a half of my time when I was like doing nothing much at work. Mm. Um, and it results in, you know, the library growing 10, 15% mm. and getting donations, mm. which is stuff, which we then use. So even if you don't get a new member, we get more stuff, which then goes out to another member. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, you have to weaponize it. You have to use them as tools mm. for, for what is a selfish purpose, which is the growth of the library. Okay. So I'm going to do my last question. I think we've covered everything else. I haven't really done the change question, but I think We've, we've kind of covered that anyway. So yeah, last question is Brexit. Um, yay. No um, comment. No comment. <laughs> well, it's, it's work related. So has it affected anything that you can see or can you not tell? Only as much as there's... Um, I mean, you started like, after we'd Brexited anyway. So, I mean, it would be like really difficult for you to kind of say... I never worked in a thing that was affected. I don't really work in industries that are affected. By, I don't really have any first-hand experience of Brexiting. Mm. Um, all of it is sort of like socio-personal in, in, impacts. Mm. Um, no, um, I don't, I could, I mean, it's six years ago we voted. So, um, mm. I think enough has changed. I don't, I really, I really, I could not comment. Um, and I was still at university when we voted. So, um, mm. it was, um, you know, it, I've not been in a work environment without Brexit really, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it wouldn't really affect us because we don't really do a lot of overseas trade. We don't really do a lot of um, work with, you know, the immigrant community particularly or, the, you know, overseas workers, nor do we. I mean, if it, if, if it comes to sort of shortages of stuff, if you if anything, the supply of those things, yeah, it's, it's like, well, it might benefit us because we'll we hopefully we'll have some of that stuff to give to people yeah. or to let them use, you know. Yeah. So... But I don't think that, but Brexit, I don't, I don't really do much shopping, but it felt like the only thing that really affected food was like certain food items. Mm -hmm. I don't really buy a lot of clothes or, and most of the tech comes from Asia anyway. So mm -hmm. only, to me, you know, the things that really affected by Brexit are things that aren't made in Asia, which isn't much, frankly, or it's very high, it's food in and out and like high tech and like, you know, services and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so I don't really know much about that, nor do I exist in those realms. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't. No, no, I really have nothing of value to say about Brexit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much my questions. I think we've covered a lot. Um, <laughs> is there anything that you want to add or anything you want to specifically talk about? Or do you want to flag up your, um, all your socials? So over to you to kind of say whatever. Thank you for having me, first of all. You're on a very old list of mine, which said, contact these people to get on your show. Mm -hmm. um, I would say to the dear listeners is, uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, and, you know, please come and use the library. Um, you know, we've got 800 things. I hope you've heard some of the things we have and, and want to have. Mm. We've got pretty much everything someone needs to do. An event or gardening or DIY or camping or holiday or fun cooking stuff or just try something you haven't done before. It's a great resource we hope we can, people can use. Mm -hmm. We're open four till six on Friday and then one till four on Saturday afternoons. We're open every weekend. We are called Buy Now LS 6 So we have a Twitter and Instagram and a Facebook. Mm -hmm. And if you can't remember that then just think Leeds library of things or heading library of things or mm. library of things Yorkshire and we'll be one of the people please come along we're pretty active on social media and our emails so if you have any questions or donations or want to volunteer with us mm. um, you, you can do that too excellent thank you thank you again yeah thank you very much for being on Jed I'll ask a last question just here you haven't have you by any chance listened to episode 8 of this podcast which is with John Barlow talking about um, John Barlow yeah it was a peer-to-peer -peer lending yeah he, uh, he scheme that he was saying library. really I know okay. John look he, he, was like, he made our website he did all of our he made the website he set our stuff on my turn 
He's a yeah. great bloke. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have a huge respect for John. I think he's done some amazing stuff and with us and hopefully we're going to work together in the future on some stuff in South Leeds. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah. Episode yeah. eight. Yeah, he tried to, yeah, he tried doing this win peer to peer. Um, yeah. But he kind of fizzled out. I don't know what he's doing with it now, but the problem is there's so many peer to peer ones already. I don't think that one more is, but actually there's actually an even weirder one. Someone sometime more start a digital library of things in Headingley, I mean, mm. excuse me, in Leeds. It was like the digital library of things Leeds. Mm. It was really small. I had like a tiny social media page. Mm. Um, yeah, John's great. He's up in Otley and he's working on the Otley 2030 stuff. And he really wants a library of things up there or they want a library of things up there in Otley, mm. which would be great. Um, so I'll hopefully um, end up working with them on that. But yeah, John's um, <laughs> so small world. Yeah, John's great. Yeah, I'm, th I'm actually unsurprised and pleased that he, you, you know, you didn't know him. Because <laughs> I, I would have thought it was strange, that, you know, that I, I was kind of, because you said there was no library of things and it was like, well, John was working on that thing. I wonder what had happened to it. And yeah. He, um, he I was introduced by Ed Carlisle. And it was, mm -hmm. and about social media. So I was introduced to my colleagues at library, Sarah, Lee and Mark through uh, Rob Greenland at Zero Waste Leeds. So he, yeah, yeah. he introduced. And so without social media and mm. that, then it wouldn't have kicked off at all. Mm. Without Facebook, we, we wouldn't have any, we, we have a fraction of what we, we, we have now. So, yeah. Um, I loved, I used to hate Facebook. I didn't have Facebook in a personal capacity, mm. but I, I literally only got it to, to facilitate the library. Um, I've had, I've deleted it three times in my life. Um, cause I, I don't, I don't want to be a guy on social media. I don't like, yeah, yeah. No. but I've realized that on the yeah, other hand, huge benefits. Okay. Yeah. Especially if you use it the right way, yeah. social media is, is a fantastic thing. And if I didn't need it initially when I deleted it, but I needed it now to achieve new goals. I mean, some of the, the, the crap CRAP pages and leads do more for the climate change than I think government policy. They're peer to peer yeah. exchange um, pages that are localized. And the amount of exchanges that go on there, bypassing eBay, bypassing charity shops, bypassing all this is phenomenal. I'm sure you could write a paper on how much money and carbon is saved by these micro transactions, localized micro transactions. Mm. It's just amazing. Just amazing. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know, you, because if it bleeds, it leads, you know, like the the media is generally, you, you look at something and the, the, the press stuff will be, you know, all the shocking outrage, you know, clickbait kind of stuff, but that obscures what's actually happening, you know, like the amount of things that are going on, the amount of like new economy stuff that's being built. And again, part of this is like at the end of this, when we get to 2030, if we get to 2030, I want to be doing this and I want like... I want to show a clear demonstration of, well, hopefully, um, like the sort of jobs that people are doing then are all way more different. You know, they're way more in line with like sustainable goals and so on as this kind of grows. And I do think it's, it's there a lot you should, and I um, hear from a lot of people. There's a lot of appetite for it as well. You should, you should talk to, um, cause you emailed us, which is great, but do you know, there's lots of, is it, it don't, I hope I'm not kind of rude when I say these things, but you should, do you know, Trad Collective, they're um, a sustainable fashion shop in Headingley. They're, oh. they're really new. And I think they're as a really sustainable job. So they do like repairs and exchange and they actually turn old wool clothing. It's like new, they like upcycle yeah. clothing and they yeah. upcycle wool and they've got like a little coffee bit and like a refill bit, scrap, you, you know, seagulls, there's, um, all the refill shops. There's Ian at Hyde Park refills. I know you spoke to him. I'm going to put that episode out today. Ah, cool. <laughs> yeah, he um he's a great bloke. Um, mm. and he's um obviously doing some great stuff. There's obviously um um there's, there's Rob at Zero Waste Leeds. He might have time for you. You could talk to some of the people at the um uh climate change hubs all across the city. Mm. Um, and they're trying to start a climate action center in the Leeds City Center. Mm. Too. So you could talk to people there. Anyone not you know um. Ed Carlisle in, at Tidal, or you could talk to some of the people at Our Future Leads, like um, mm. they're good, or you could talk to um, oh God, uh, some people at Revive Centers, maybe some people there. So there's one in the Kirk, so there's one at, um, at the uh, at, at Seacroft. There's a whole bunch of, um, you know, oh, there's some really cool ones. It's like they're on Instagram. They're called like won wonky clothing, catch up clothing, and they like make like plus, plus size upscaled streetwear, like recycled streetwear. There's mag, there's like, um, kind of sparking communities who 
she's like green magpie. She does like a whole bunch of like reusable clothing. There's a whole, and there's, um, you know, you should, if you want to find out the sustainability stuff in, in Leeds I, without being kind of trite, you should look at the map that they've generated from the Yorkshire Circular Economy Festival, mm -hmm. all about the cool people there mm. who like upscale stuff or, or upcycle or recycle or turn one thing into another. Mm. There's like bed knobs and something, something you like upcycle furniture and then act, and they do it at the, the seagulls paint. There's the seagulls workshop. So, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's getting better and bigger. Mm. Um, but this, yeah, like they said, there's these really cool fashion ones. Um, and like once you do jewelry, like upcycled silk, like whole people who make jewelry mm. almost exclusively from jewelry that people don't wear anymore. So it's like upcycled, mm. it's like, like recycled silver. Mm. Uh, and they make a whole bunch of jewelry um, um, that way. If you just scroll through the people I follow, mm. you'll probably see a lot of them there. We follow at the library. I think there's a whole bunch. I mean, Leeds is great. Yeah. It really is for all this stuff. Thanks again to Dead for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And then, of course, most of all, thank you to you, my dear listener, for listening. Come back next week to hear me speak to a man who works with words and sound and electricity. No, I'm not interviewing myself. I'm going to close out this week in the words of Buckminster Fuller, who I have mentioned a couple of times in the show. War has taught man that it is all right to use our scarce resources to dominate and kill people. We must now make the decision to reallocate those resources to help people live better. If we only prepare for war, that's what we will know. We must also prepare for peace by converting some of our weaponry to livingry. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. If you're listening to this, I assume you have some connection to Leeds, like living here or being from here. If you're such a person in Leeds or from Leeds and you haven't done your recording for working hours yet, then don't wait. Email me now, right now. Quick, get a pen. Working hours pod at western studios.com. If you fancy being my guest, put guest in the subject line of your email and add a short bio in the message. Stick in some suggestions of your availability and I'll send you a release form and a Zoom invite. If you'd like to be on working hours, I will need a two hour window for us to record in. I can record in your work time or during your downtime. I have been recording interviews for working hours for every year on Zoom, but I can also record offline. You can appear on Working Hours anonymously, or you can promote yourself and or your company or brand, cleaner or owner. What is your experience? How do you feel about work? What do you like and not like? What do you do, Leeds? Be a part of local history. Have your voice heard. Share your wisdom. Give us the inside skinny. This is your show, Leeds, and it's all about what you make of yourself. Do you know what you're doing? If you do, then come and tell me all about it. Come on Working Hours, even if you don't know what you're doing. I certainly don't. Email me right now. Quick, get a pen. Working hours pod at western-studios.com. If you're allowed to do that, that is. If you're not allowed to do that, then tell me why. If you and your business aren't ashamed of what you do, then let's hear all about it. What good are you doing the rest of us? Are you socially useful? Am I? Is this? Send your feedback, questions, comments, and queries right now to working hours pod at western-studios.com. What is happening, Leeds? Find out by following this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads to find out when new episodes are going to be released. Or just use the hashtag hash Working Hours Pod Leads on either of those sites to find me. I'm on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Western underscore studios underscore leads. I'm also on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash Simon hyphen Treen. Treen is T R double E N. Or you can go to my company page, which is linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Western hyphen studios. If you want to make a podcast in Leeds, whether it's for a cause, a publicity campaign, a product promotion, or your own passion project, then get in touch with me, Western Studios, for support, advice, and guidance on anything podcasts. At Western Studios, you work with a real life lawyer who is actually in Leeds, who you can actually work with on making podcast content. So don't wade through articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts. Just get on with it. Western Studios can make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios can take on your podcast's boring, time-consuming and painful admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about it. I feel your pain. For a charge, I'll share it. Writers, 
What are you doing with your lives? Hopefully you're writing. Well, I know there are listeners out there who want to hear great original writing performed as audio content and made in Leeds. How do I know this? Because I'm one of them. Help me make Muck for Brass, a series of short stories, poems, performers, whatever, all published as podcast content. Is your work arty, salacious, pulpy, strange? Good. I want to make it a podcast. I get practice making the show and you get a finished, performed and published version of your writing. Businesses, campaigns, brands, got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to start. Hit me up at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and we'll start making your podcast straight away. The first hour of arranged consultation and pre-production time is free. So what do you have to lose? And what are you waiting for? Save yourself the hassle and the headache and make your podcast with a Leeds-based, in real life, podcast producer, that's me, Western Studios Leeds. Once again, please let Working Hours get big and strong by joining its Patreon. Support Working Hours by becoming a champion on Patreon for a pound a month. You can inspire me and motivate me with a membership and maybe one day even be helping to cover all my costs. You can chat to me there and see me do a monthly live stream where again you can chat to me all about the show and God, do I need to find someone to actively share this project with. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod right now and sign up, please. And or go to Kofi, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash working hours and join me there for a pound a month and get access to the working hours discord and chat to me there. I will be putting up additional material on Kofi once there are any members there. Please do remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to this show. Every little bit helps. Tell your gran, tell your housekeeper, tell your gardener, tell your parole officer, tell your boss, tell Leeds and I'll see thee next time, our kid. Working Hours is presented, edited and recorded by Simon Treem for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org.